It's like, I, I mean, you think you've had a bad Christmas? I mean, my Christmas. I'm here, you know, I'm making a speech. I mean, I mean, I mean, I hope you have a lovely Hanukkah and everything, but... Queen's speech, George, look, us take two. <laughs> Queen's speech, Alan Bennett, take four. To say that Christmas this year was a disappointment would be understating the fact to a massive degree. The pudding, notwithstanding it tasting appalling, contained not what one was expecting fine Victorian threepences, but a euro. I think it makes wonderful material for spoofing, doesn't it? I mean, you only have to say that wonderful phrase, my husband and I, and everybody kind of falls about. My husband and I think of you, our subject, sitting in the comfort of your own homes, in your armchairs and on your settees. And we cannot help but think, stuff this for a game of soldiers. <laughs> It's some years since the content of the Queen's speech was at the centre of rumour and speculation in the run-up to Christmas, but it's still cloaked in more secrecy than Santa's home phone number. A better word, perhaps, uh, to use rather than secrecy is confidentiality. Uh, the broadcast has to have an impact. I had to drag myself along. It always seemed to be raining and very, very cold to a, a little office in West London secret location you know can't tell you exactly where and uh, I was uh, would go in there and there'd be a, an official from the BBC usually and I would be asked to sign a piece of paper promising that I wasn't going to disclose anything of what I was about to see then we'd be taken to another room and the tape would be there be put into the machine and would be shown the Queen's broadcast on one very famous occasion, parts of the speech were leaked in a tabloid newspaper, uh, and whilst it didn't actually affect uh, the uh, success of the broadcast, clearly it begins to challenge it and, and weaken its position. A very Merry Christmas to you all. <laughs> As I think of you, my loyal customers, Sitting at home round your firesides this Christmas, <laughs> it brings home to me very strongly the enormous responsibility that I have as your milkman. The Queen's speech, in truth, has always been at three o'clock. It is, like income tax and death, one of the certainties of life. For some reason, back then, we were fascinated by the Queen. Even though she was motionless, we'd sit and watch the Queen's speech. Um, that was always... I can remember my parents saying, stop, everyone, stop, stop playing with your toys, stop what you're doing, because she's on. And it's like, right, and then once we've seen her, then we can have something to eat. For anyone who misses the Queen's speech on Christmas Day, there's bad news. It's unlike anything else that goes out on television in that it's guaranteed not to be repeated. Not a single moment from her speech is allowed to be shown again after Christmas. The responsibility uh, of working with Her Majesty the Queen uh, is uh, extraordinarily daunting. All right. <laughs> Very highly experienced uh, directors uh, work with her who know how to handle themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think it must be the dogs, yeah. <laughs> Once or twice, there have been important things, important times, and we have all paid attention. But mostly these days, I'm afraid, do we really care what Her Majesty has to say on Christmas Day? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to tell her, Tom. OK, fine. <laughs> Wasn't really your fault, but Tom thinks it would be a nice idea if you left out all that stuff about the Commonwealth. OK. <laughs> we have all the knickers off everybody, do we? The important thing is to win the audience leading into the Queen before three o'clock, and then win the audience again after the Queen has finished, usually at 10 past three or 3.15, and win the audience for the rest of the evening. And the highlight of that evening for many in the 80s would be the two Ronnies Christmas special. <coughs> anyway, I said to the producer, can you get me the big chair? And he said, no, because, you see, he's a very, very mean man. A very mean man indeed. Uh, he, he, for Christmas, I went round his house and in the pudding there was an AOU. And, in fact, I knew that my producer played Santa Claus at a, a local school and he sat on the children's laps and told them what he wanted. Anyway, would you meet 
and greet the two runnies. <laughs> The magic Christmases were the two Ronnies. Really found it funny and I was like, wow. And maybe that was the first time I was taking tiny baby steps towards, ooh, maybe I want to move into the world of comedy by watching those two gentlemen. Crawling down chimneys with somebody's present. I sometimes get stuck in the suit's most unpleasant. Finds its way everywhere right through your clothes. Gets in my navel and gets up my nose. The Two Ronnies Christmas Show would contain their usual mix of sketches and skits, but also lavish musical productions. We took more trouble and dressed it and decorated it, and the clothes were more luscious and more uh, of that time of year. For tonight we'll all hang out, tomorrow we'll hang over. I was trying to think of something where we could both play Santa Claus. Yeah. And, uh, so I suddenly thought of stereo. Stereo was then, I mean, that's years ago. You know, stereo was then sort of quite novel, you know. <laughs> stereo. <laughs> We're a couple of stereo Santas. See us in our place of work. Preparing the annual fantasy. It's work we never should. No, never. Buy. Ronnie as well loved the idea of Stilton and walnuts and port and brandy and twinkling candles, you know, we liked to make it feel like a Christmas card. Let every man living enjoy Christmas <laughs> The two Ronnies did Christmas. It was no small thing, I can assure you. It was big in every sense of the word. One of the sketches we did was Alice in Wonderland, and this was built in our studios. And we had this, it must have been a 30-foot long table, which we did in perspective, so it was, it was narrow at one end, it got wider towards the camera. And it was really, really lavish. I'm the hare. He's the hare. <laughs> He's the hatter. And the former is as loony as the latter. Your hat is on fire. I'm smouldering with desire for Alice in her winter underwear. Alice contains so many double acts. It, it contains the Mad Hatter and the March Hare as a double act, the Cook and the Duchess. Christmas Eve, oh dear me, got to bed at half past three. Christmas morning, kids are up at dawn. Who gave Willie that hunting horn? The King and Queen of Hearts is a double act. Uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. We're Tweedledum and Tweedledee. We're not pretty really twins, as you can see. He's smaller than me, he's fatter than me, and we both like filling our faces. But I do remember this, this wonderful 30-foot-long table groaning with chocolates, mince pies, all that the, the two Ronnies used to love picking at. Truffles and trifles and dipsy cake. We might go off bang without warning. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not bother with TV, shall us? At the end of the 70s, the two Ronnies Christmas special was more often than not shown on Boxing Day. Christmas Day was reserved for Morecambe and Wise. I'd rather watch Fulham at home to Chris. To Palace. <laughs> but when Morecambe and Wise left for ITV, Barker and Corbett's show became the centrepiece of the big day, and that's how it stayed for nearly a decade. When Morecambe and Wise had gone to ITV. They were a, a major part of Christmas night, and I wish they were happening now. <laughs> a Merry Christmas to you. It's wonderful to be back with you and on Christmas night itself, isn't it, Ronnie? Indeed it is. The producer said, what are we going to do with them at the beginning? Walking down the stairs, walking on, it's all been done. And I said, news at ten. <laughs> But first, the news. The Catering Council has promised that in 1985, the Sage and Onion Bullet will become generally available. This means, of course, you'll be...